after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, as he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. How many of you know he's risen from the dead this morning? And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. They will see me. I, he said they'll see me. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. They said, let me tell you what we just saw. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we sleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Here's the topic I want to preach on just for a few minutes this morning. Church, it's time to debunk the conspiracy. Come on. It's time to debunk the conspiracy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you, we glorify you. Let this word go forth as good seed, fall it on good grounds to all that will hear it. Let it go deep down inside of the hearts and minds, grow deep roots. Grow, mature, produce fruit for us to eat on and live by. God, let today be the day for someone's salvation. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory for what we're about to experience. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Praise God, I'm going to leave this playing because we're going to leave it playing for the baptism too, so I don't want to turn it off. But I want to preach just for a few minutes. Debunk. The conspiracy. It's time to debunk the conspiracy. What's taking place right here is Jesus, the Son of God. He lived 33 and a half years. When he got to age 30, um, he began his ministry. And for three and a half years, Jesus done miraculous things. Everything that the Old Testament told us that he would do, he did it. He done everything. There was not one prophecy that went unmentioned. He done it. They said he'd ride in on a donkey. And Jesus, knowing that, told his disciples, he said, there's a colt tied up down there. And go and get him and bring him back because I need him. I've got to have him. I've got to have that donkey. I've got to have him because the prophecy says that I'll ride in on a donkey and it's got to be that one. And he rides in on a donkey. The Bible said that he would open blinded eyes. The Bible said that he would preach to the poor. And the Bible says that his um that one of his best friends would betray him. The Bible says that he would be whipped. The Bible says that he would be beaten. The Bible says that he would be crucified. The Bible says that he would be laid into a tomb. The Bible says that three days later he would raise up. The Bible says that he would ascend. The Bible says that the temple would be destroyed and three days later he would raise it back up. The Bible prophesied all those things and everyone that the Bible
Bible said that the Messiah must do. Jesus done it. He raised the dead. He opened blinded eyes. He saved the lost. Jesus done it all. He conquered it all. And the world could not stand it. They could not stand the fact that Jesus was healing these people. They could not stand the fact that he was delivering these men and women from sin and from bondage and from demonic possession. They could not stand it. So what do they do? They take him, they go and they get him and they arrest him and they bring him to Pilate and they tell Pilate, we want this man sentenced to death for blaspheming. He's blasphemed and we want him sentenced to death. And Pilate says, I'm a Roman. This man, this man is a Hebrew. We need to send him up the road to Herod. And he gets to Herod and Herod says, well, how about you perform a miracle for me? Show me that you are who you say you are. And Jesus knowing that he, Jesus, he doesn't, let me tell you something about him. He doesn't just put on a show for people. He doesn't, he doesn't entertain people. He doesn't, he healed people for a ministry. He turned water into wine for a ministry. Come on, somebody. Everything he done was for ministry. It was not for entertainment. He didn't do it to put on a show. That's why when people come to me and they say, you know, if you quiet down and you wouldn't preach so loud, you'd probably have more people come to your church. If you just calm down a little bit and you wouldn't shout so much, you'd have more people come to your church. You'd be able, if you'd play more of these type songs, if you would do this, if you would do that, let me tell you something, baby. I don't do it for entertainment. I do it because I serve the King of Glory. And I've got something to shout about. I've got something to praise Him about. So Jesus says, no, I'm not, I'm not putting on a show for nobody. He sends him back to Pilate. During this time, the Jews, they were in a feast. And during this feast, it is, it, it's one of their traditions to bring a prisoner out and to release him, to set him free. <laughs> and he brings Jesus and a criminal before the people. And he says... Who would you like to release for this feast? Jesus from Nazareth or this criminal, this murderer, this thief? And they said, give us Barabbas. Give us the murderer. Give us the criminal. Listen to me. They say the thief on the cross was there, was the first one to ever receive grace. I'm going to have to Disagree with you. It was Barabbas. Yeah. Barabbas deserved the cross. Come on, somebody. Yeah, right. Bar Barabbas deserved the death sentence. Yeah. Barabbas is me and you. Because let me tell you something. I may be a pastor. I may be a preacher. But I deserve death. I deserve. I deserve hell. I deserve punishment. I'm a criminal. If I put my life up against the Ten Commandments, I fall short on just about every single one of them. I'm a criminal. But just like Barabbas, I've been set free. And some other man took my place. And that man's name was Jesus. He took my place on the cross. He goes, to, he goes to a whipping post. They beat him and 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 they beat him until he was unrecognizable. They couldn't even make out who he was anymore. Jesus should have never left the whipping post. Everything should have ended right there. He should have died at the whipping post, but he didn't. But that wasn't enough punishment for him. They took a cross and they said, now you take this cross and you carry it up that hill called Calvary. And up there, when you get up there, we're going to pierce you in your hands. We're going to pierce you in your feet. And we're going to hang you on this cross and let you suffocate on your own blood. Yeah. You say, that's, that's gruesome. We don't need to talk about that in church. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. He, that's, how, that's how nine times out of ten people died on, on the cross. They suffocated on their own blood. Their blood, their blood would fill up in their lungs and they couldn't breathe. And so that, that's what they did. He gets up there to Calvary. They put nails in his feet. They put nails in his hands. 
And when he gives up the ghost, let's back up. He's on the cross. What's he doing? He's still forgiven. He's on the cross. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, Lord. They don't know who they're crucifying. If they knew who they were putting to death, they wouldn't be doing this, but they don't know. They're ignorant. If they knew me, I, I, I'm sorry. Some of you may not agree with me, but I believe he's still in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's telling the Father, Daddy, if they knew who I was, they wouldn't be living that life. If they knew who I was, they wouldn't be doing the things they're doing. But they're ignorant. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am. They don't know who I am. And the Bible says that he gives up the ghost. He died. And they come with a spear. And they pierce him in the side. And all of his fluids run out of him. All the blood, all the water runs out of him. They take him down off the cross. They lay him in Joseph's borrowed tomb. He's just borrowing it for the weekend. Joseph said, I'm not worried about it. He's just borrowing it for the weekend. They lay him down in this tomb. And after they lay him down in this tomb, the Pharisees are still worried about this man. Now this is where I've been trying to get to all morning. If you ain't heard nothing else I've said, listen right here. They are so worried about this man that they have just killed that after they lay him in a tomb, they go, to, they go back to Pilate. And they say, now Pilate, I know that we put this man to death. But this man said that we would kill him. Listen to me. This man told us that we would kill him. This man has already warned us of what we were going to do. But there's more to the story, Pilate. He didn't just say that we would kill him. But he said in three days, he's going to get back up again. And we're worried that he might really do it. Listen to me. What's Pilate say? Pilate says, this is what we'll do. We'll roll a stone in front of the, in front of the tomb. And I'm going to seal it. We're going to seal it. What does that mean? And when that word, that word right there, seal, it's not talking about just sealing it with a rock. It's talking about Pilate put his seal on it. And what that means is if that seal is broken, you are breaking the law. A king's seal cannot be broken. Watch this. They're so scared that a dead man's going to get up. <laughs> that they're saying, in case he does, we're going to kill him again. Because he's breaking another law. <laughs> so Pilate, seal it with your seal. He puts the, they put the rock in front of the place. He seals it with his seal. And then they said, in case that's not enough, we're going to put a guard out front. Somebody that can watch it. 24-7, 365. Because we don't want this man getting up. And then we get to Matthew 28. And the Bible says that Mary Magdalene is headed to the tomb to anoint the grave site of Jesus. When she gets there, an angel comes down from heaven, moves the stone out of the way, breaks the seal. Listen to me. This is what blows my mind. She, he's she, The angel's the one that moved the stone. The angel's the one that broke the seal. The angel sits down on the, on the stone. The, the guard is so scared, he's laid out like he's dead. He's like laid out like a dead man, shaking and trembling under fear. And, and then the angel looks at Mary Magdalene, Martha, and this is what she said. The angel says, he says, Mary, go and look. There ain't nobody in there. There ain't nobody in there. I, when I came and moved the stone away, he was already gone. He had already got up. He had already walked out of the tomb. He had already done it. I got here and opened up the door. And somehow, some way, he is already out of here. Oh! He was already gone. Go and look. Go and look. I believe Mary Magdalene peeked into the tomb, looked over there where Jesus was laying, and a shout came over her. And she said, oh my goodness, he's done it again. Oh my goodness, he's done it again. He's 
Jesus done it by himself. He didn't need no help. They said, well, the angel come move the stone for him. Baby, he walked through that stone. Go read it. Uh, she goes and, you know, come on, men. Y'all going to know where I'm coming from right here. This ain't, this ain't, y'all saying, yeah, you preaching a little different. The anointing's calling for something a little different today. Yes. Come on. They say, me and y'all know what I'm talking about right here. We don't like to listen to women. Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I changed my GPS to the man's voice. I'm tired of women telling me what to do. My mama tells me what to do. My mama tells me what to do. My wife tells me what to do. GPS, I ain't listening to no woman tell me where to turn. So Mary Magdalene, she's on her way. She's on her way to tell the disciples about Jesus. I believe she's in a dead sprint at Donna. She's taking off. She's running. She's running as fast as she can to get there. But the Bible tells us that where the disciples were sitting, Jesus just fell. He knew that they probably wouldn't really listen to a woman because of the culture and because of the time uh, that they were living in. So what does Jesus do? The Bible says he just shows up and reveals himself to all his disciples. He says, here I am. I've done exactly what I told you I was going to do. The Pharisees are now finding out about what he's done. They are now getting word that the grave is empty. And they said, we've got to get a plan together. They go to the high priest, the, all the, the soldiers. And there's, a, there's a thing, they say, well, it was Roman soldiers because Pilate dispatched them. But here's my thing. If it was Roman soldiers, then why did they report to the high priest? Couldn't have been Roman soldiers. Had to be temple soldiers. Temple soldier reports to the high priest, you are not going to believe what I saw. I saw an angel come down. The ground began to shake. I passed out because of, I was so afraid. And when I came back to, not only was the angel gone, but the man we put in that tomb was gone too. The high priest says, this is what we're going to do. Sam, this is going to sound like the President of the United States. This is what we're going to do. We're going to lie. <laughs> we're going to lie. I'm not preaching Republican or Democrat. They all lie to us. He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to act like a real good politician. And we're going to tell a lie. And we're going to form a conspiracy. And in this conspiracy, this is how it's going to work. We're going to tell them that the, that the um, disciples came, that his followers came, and they stole him out of the grave. They came and stole his body. But you see, the soldier didn't like that idea. And this is how I know. Because if he would have allowed them to steal the body, then he himself would have been put to death. That was his punishment. You as a guard, if you've allowed them to take the body, that means you allowed them to break the seal. Now you are going to be punished and put to death. And he said, I don't like that. I don't like that idea at all. I'm not taking the fall for all of you. Just, just because y'all didn't like the man. Just because y'all didn't believe in the man. Just because y'all didn't trust the man. I'm not being put to death. And he says this. He says, if you'll do this, if you'll tell this lie for me, if you'll form this conspiracy for me and help me push this ideology on everybody, then when the government finds out about it, about it we will appease them and we'll make them play along with us and nobody will be punished. So this great conspiracy is formed that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that around the Jewish people, that lie is still being told today but here's the question that I have how in the world if it was if they took a dead body out of the grave and they went and hid it and buried him somewhere else then how a little over 2,000 years later did I meet that same man how in the world 2,000 years later did you meet that same man how is he still healing how is he still touching how is he still delivering if he never got up out of the grave because I met him I've seen him and I'm here to tell everybody about it I'm here to debunk the conspiracy the conspiracy 
conspiracy is over. I've met that man named Jesus. Asked the man at the gates of beautiful. He laid there paralyzed. He laid there. He couldn't move. And he's begging for alms. And here come Peter and John headed to the temple. And as they're headed to the temple, they pass by this paralyzed man. And he says, alms, alms, alms. Peter and John said, gold and silver have I none. But what I have I give unto you. And what I've got is the truth. I've got the truth, and the truth is Jesus lives. The truth is he's alive and well. The truth is I met him. The truth is I've seen him. He come and got me off my boat. That's probably what Peter said. Peter probably told everybody, I had went back fishing. I had gave up. I had seen him get laid in that tomb. I had put it to rest. I went back to what I knew to do, and that was the fish. I went and got my boat back. I went and got my net back, but I'm out there fishing one day, and a man that I that I thought I'd never see again was sitting on the beach, and he already had on the fire what I was trying to catch. Jesus out there on the beach cooking fish. You see, we're out there in the ocean a lot of times and we're casting our nets and we're trying to find joy over here, peace over there, and Jesus is already on the beach preparing it for us. And he's saying, Peter, come on back to me. I've got what you're looking for. I'm here to debunk the conspiracy. I'm here to debunk the conspiracy. You can go and you can go to the, to the tomb where they laid Buddha. You can go and you can find the idols that they made for Krishna. You can go and you can talk to them and you can get all this information and you can they can help you try and find inner peace and they can do all these things. But let me tell you what they can't do. They can't save you from a devil's hell. They can't save you from sin. They can't give you joy. They can't give you peace unspeakable. They can't give you peace that surpasses under all understanding. I've seen Jesus cure cancer. I've seen Jesus dry up tumors right before my eyes. I've seen him heal people from disease. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And I'm here to tell everybody that he lives and the conspiracy's over. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. I'm, ti I'm tired of the conspiracy. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of people asking me, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Go to Israel and find the tomb where they laid him and see if it's not empty. See if he doesn't lay. See if he's still laying there. That's all the evidence I need. That's all I need to know is that his tomb is empty. It's empty. He's alive and well. And they say, well, that may not, that might not be enough for me. Twelve guys run around. And they start telling everybody that they've seen this man. What about the two that were on the road of Emmaus? They're walking down the road. And they're saying they're all depressed, oppressed, ain't got no joy left in them. They just seen who they thought was the Savior be killed, be crucified. They're on the road of Emmaus. They're walking down this road. And Jesus appears to them and he begins to talk to them. And they said, man, do you not know? Do you not know what just happened back there? Everybody was telling me that man was the Messiah. And they just killed him. And Jesus, after they get to their destination, Jesus reveals it. He says, I am that man. I'm the same man they crucified. I'm the same man that they laid into a borrow tomb. I am that man. But here I am, alive and well, talking to you. I was that man. And they received it. They believed. They knew it was him. You say, well, I don't know if he's alive. That's Paul. Paul was a Paul was a, a debunker like I. Paul didn't believe. He was a he was a conspiracy theorist. 
But one day he's on the road of Damascus and he meets a man. And he says, who art thou, Lord? And he says, it is I, Jesus, whom you crucified. Why do you kick against the pricks? Why are you going against something that you know that, that is wrong? Why are you doing this? You know that I was laid in that tomb. You know that they crucified me. And you yourself, you know that the tomb is empty. Paul, I know you received word that I was no longer there. And you still refuse to believe. So here I am showing myself real to you. I'm going to let you experience me like ain't nobody ever experienced me. Thomas didn't believe. Thomas fell into the conspiracy. Jesus showed himself to him. He said, it looks like you. It sounds like you. But I'm having a hard time believing it's you. He said, Thomas, come and look at the scars in my hand. Look at the scars in my feet. Look at the, look at the hole in my side. Thomas, if you want to, you can take your hand and put it up into my side. Thomas reaches out. And when he touches Jesus and feels the realness, he says, oh, me. It's him. It's him. It's him. I don't serve a God that needs preachers to stand up here and deep up the conspiracy. He is a God that proves himself. If you will look for him, you will find him. He's been proving himself since day one. He shut Noah and his family up in the ark and proved himself. 150 prophets of Baal tried to, tried to say he wasn't nothing but a conspiracy. He wasn't nothing but, but some fairy tale. And what did he do? He proved himself. He answered by fire and proved himself. I serve a God that didn't just die for my sins. But he got up out of that grave. And the Bible says that now he's ascended and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And He intercedes for me and you. That means He prays for us. He prays for us. My son Lane. <coughs> when we lay him down at night, we pray with him. Y'all say, well, we say night prayers. No, you don't understand. I line him up in front of my recliner. And I sit down on the edge of my recliner. And when it's bedtime, they know what time it is. They come and they line up. And this is what I do. I lay my hand on their head. And I say, I pray for my daughter right here, right now, Jesus. You touch her. You minister to her. So that one day you can minister through her. Because if you ain't never been ministered to, don't think that you can minister through. I pray for them. And I'll line them up and I'll pray for them. And then I'll get them and I'll, I'll, I'll get them to say their night prayers. And Lane prays different than anybody that I've ever heard pray. He's six. And now his sister Ellie is three. And she's heard Big Brother pray this way. And now this is how she prays. And at first I thought it was cute. Until I was reminded of the scripture where it says Jesus intercedes for us. This is how Lane prays. We pray like this. I pray for my mom. I pray for my dad. I pray for my aunts, my uncles. And we'll say, Lord, I'm praying for. I'm praying for. This is how Lane prays. And now Ellie prays this way. Jesus, pray for my mommy. Jesus, pray for my daddy. Because you are the great intercessor. And if I can convince you to speak to the Father on our behalf. Come on. <laughs> now Ellie, when she says not prayers... Jesus, pray for my brother. This is, what De this is what Ellie said the other night. So much faith in a child. Ellie lays down the other night. Ellie's been having bad dreams at night. But the other night when I took her into bed, she said, Jesus, pray for me. Because I don't want to have bad dreams. But see, here's the thing. And this is how I know he's real. When she woke up the next morning, she could not wait to get in there to daddy. And she come in there, daddy, 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 I prayed last night and I didn't have no bad dreams. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. I serve a God that hears his people and answers from heaven. He answers 
answers prayers. He answers prayers. <laughs> Ain't that awesome? Ain't that awesome? And my children grow up and they know. They know that prayer works because they have experienced it firsthand. We get in here, we're filling up the baptism, baptismal, however you say it. And Lane says, Daddy, I want to get baptized. I'm different. I know. I know I'm different, and that's okay. But I won't dunk my child just because he wants to get wet. I'm different. I'm different. And, and that's okay. That's okay. If, if, if you want them to do it, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not preaching against it. Raise them up. Hey, let, if they want to get dunked, let them get dunked. But here's the thing. I didn't want my son just to get in the water just to get in the water. I told him, I said, do you know what it means to get baptized? No, sir. Let me tell you why. This is why people get baptized, son. Getting baptized does nothing but get you wet. It doesn't, it doesn't save you. There's a lot of people. Oh, God, don't make this sense. There's a lot of people that get in this water and nothing changes about them. Can I, can I go further? Can I go further? There's a lot of people come down here and get on their knees and cry a few tears and nothing changes about them. But see, here's the thing, son. What people are doing is they're symbolizing. They're saying, they're saying the dead man's going down. And the new man's coming up. That they've been saved and they've asked Jesus to come into their heart. And he says, you know what, Daddy? I don't just want to get baptized. But I want to do that. I said, you want to do what? He said, I want to ask Jesus. To come into my heart. And we sat right here. I sat in that chair and he sat on that table. And we sat right there. And my son sitting there as serious as I'm standing here before you right now. He said... Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And if I ain't got you, I ain't got nothing. I need you to come into my life. Change me. Shape me. Mold me into the man that you called me to be. You say he's six. He ain't a sinner. You were born a sinner. They say, they ask me, they say, they will. They say, Justin, if, if Jesus loves us so much, why does he send us to hell? I say, you don't. You're on your way to hell already. I'm already on my way to hell. Jesus says you ain't got to go there. I, I'm making a way of escape for you. The moment that you were born, the Bible says you were born into sin. And you were shaped by iniquity. You were born a mess. You were born messed up. You were born with stinking thinking. When I was born, I was messed up from the chest up. Come on. Yeah. Tore up from the floor up. Beat up from the feet up. I was. I was, I was, I was messed up. But man, messed up. Messed up. You say, well, you ain't, you ain't done everything I've done. Don't be surprised. I've done a lot. But here's the thing. I may have not have done what you've done, but Jesus went to the cross for you. Just like he went to the cross for them. But, 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 but brother Justin, but pastor, but Justin, whatever you want to call me. But man, you don't understand. I've done it before. I've given my life to him before. I've asked him to save me before. But now I'm right back where I started. That's okay. Because he'll do it again. I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday. This is what I, we was talking, talking about the Bible and certain things. And this is what I told him. I said, not falling is not what makes you righteous. People think, well, you're righteous if you never fall. But that's not the truth. This is the truth. The Bible says a righteous man falls down seven times. And gets back up. Right. Falling. Not falling. That's not what makes you righteous. It's when you're down there deciding to get up. And dust yourself off. And continue on the journey. That's what decides if you're righteous or not. If 
you will, please stand all over the house. Hallelujah. It was a little different today. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. People don't like the every head bowed, every eye closed thing. They say, well, you know, the Bible says if you're ashamed of me, it'll be ashamed of you. It's okay. We don't need nobody looking around. You know, it doesn't matter. But see, here's the thing. Some of you are ready to take that step. Others of you, you still don't know. You still don't know. We're all at different places right now. And I'm going to try and reach you the best way I can reach you. So here's the question. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Here's the question. If you're standing in here today and you say, Brother Justin, I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. Will you lift up your hand? I want to accept Him as my personal Savior. Hallelujah. I see Him. I see Him. One more. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If this is you, if you say, Brother Justin, I've known him, but I've slipped away. I'm not, I'm not living for him like I know that I should. I, I don't even care if it's this. I'm not as on fire for him as I should be. I believe, some of you in here, you may even believe you're saved, but you're just not doing everything that you know you ought to be doing. But you say, today that changes. If that's you, slip up your hand. Hallelujah. Hands all over the house. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So I want you to do it. Everybody that will, this is what I want you to say. Say, Dear Father, come into my life. Shape me. Mold me into the person that you have called me to be. Set me on fire again and again. And again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise all over the house. Hey guys, I hope today's message has encouraged you and has built your faith because our Bibles tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I pray that we've placed the seed of faith inside of you today. Um, if there's uh, anything that you would like to request prayer for or anything like that, you can always go to our website houseofthepromisechurch.com go to the link that says prayer request and send in any prayer request that you may have but I want to take just for a few minutes and pray with you guys that the Holy Spirit would just continue to lead you and guide you and direct you in the way that you should go dear Heavenly Father we just pray right now and we ask that any situation any circumstance that anybody may be facing right now God God I pray that you would intervene like only you can God I pray that your healing power God would go forth and touch them that are sick your delivering power would go forth and free them that are in captivity and save those that are lost God God we give you all the praise honor and glory in Jesus name Amen thank you for watching and be blessed